Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to another ICTS string seminar this week. We're very happy to have Shiraz Minwala from TIFR Mumbai. He's going to tell us about the endpoint of the super radiant instability of the Kerr black hole in ADS. For people online and in the audience here, feel free to unmute yourselves and ask questions during the talk. I'm not uh, looking at who's asking questions on the chat, the computer. Okay. All your Shiraz. Okay, so it's great to be back in ICTS. Um, my talk today is, uh, as uh, as was said, is the, is is titled "Gray Galaxies as the Endpoint of the Kerr Superadiant Instability." The talk is based on this paper on the archive, written along with these collaborators, including my uh, current student uh, Chintan Patel, who is extremely good. Um, now. Um, Suppose, so, so let's start with the motivation in the introduction. Okay, suppose we're interested in studying uh, conformal field theory. Okay, through this talk for concreteness, and because that's where we've done the calculations, I will spe specialize to conformal field theories in three dimensions. Okay, so say we're interested in studying a conformal field theory in three dimensions. Okay, um, say you're handed a conformal field theory, uh, it's an interacting conformal field theory. And you want to find out, you want to know, understand about the, uh, the conformal field theory. Perhaps the first question you would ask is the following. What is the spectrum of operators in this conformal field theory? Okay. Uh, give me a list of operators labeled by the energy, uh, by the scaling dimension and the angular momentum of the operator. Now, why, why do I say scaling dimension and angular momentum? You see, the... Uh, Symmetry group of a, of a conformal field theory in three dimensions is SO3, comma 2. And uh, the Cartan of the symmetry group is the Cartan of SO3 times SO2. The SO2 is the scaling dimension. And the Cartan of SO3 is Z component of angular momentum. Okay? So if you label operators by their Cartan elements, you're labeling them by uh, delta, which is the eigenvalue under the SO2 of SO3, comma 2, and JZ, which I'll often just call J through the talk, which is the Cartan of the SO3. Okay? So the list of operators that, 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 you, that you can demand in such a conformal field theory is labeled by JZ and delta. Okay? Now, 
given a normal interacting conformal field theory, um, you might want to know this list of operators. Uh, this is, of course, not all the information you can ask for for conformal field theory. There are more, there are OP coefficients and so on, uh, three point function coefficients and so on. But um, even this list, this list of operators, is very hard to come by. For large n conformal field theories that have a two derivative gravity dual, on the other hand, at least in an appropriately coarse grained sense, the situation is much better. So that we focus, as we will through this talk, on operators, um, they, which will soon become states in a minute, whose energies and angular momenta are all of order n squared. Okay? And I want to know how many operators there are which have energy between, or oh, scaling dimension between delta and delta plus delta, a small change in delta, jz between jz and a small change in jz. We know the answer to this question, or we think we know the answer to this question, uh, from the ads CFT correspondence. So how do, we, how do we know or think we know the answer to this question from there? Well, the first step is to use the state operator map. In any conformal field theory, there's a one-to-one -one map between operators of the theory and states of the theory on S2. So the question of characterizing the spectrum of theories, the spectrum of operators in the theory, is the same as characterizing the spectrum of the uh, states in the theory when quantized on S2. Under this map, dimensions of operators map to, scale, uh, map to energies on the sphere. Energy is minus Casimir energies, for those of you who are pedantic. Okay? And angular momenta of the operators map to angular momentum of the state on the sphere. Okay, you've got a space on an S to it as angular momentum, as SO3. Okay, now this helps you in the following way. So the characterization of the spectrum of a, of a conformal field theory um, in terms of states uh, at energies of order n squared, uh, it can be accomplished using a famous element in the ads CFT dictionary. And that famous element in the ads CFT dictionary tells is that, uh, is that the entropy of states at when energies of, of, of order n square is the entropy of the black hole with the corresponding charges. Okay, so suppose you are interested in entropies of states at energies E and angular momentum J, both are of order n square. You search for black holes in the bulk which carry energy E and angular momentum J. If you find more than one black hole, you should look at all of them and choose the one with the largest entropy. To compute the the Bekenstein entropy of, of the black holes, if there's more than one, you, can, you, you choose the largest one of them, that gives you the entropy of the states in the CFD. Okay, so great. Now, if we try to implement this algorithm, if we try, of course, please stop me with questions or comments at any point. Why do you say the largest entropy, why not? The well, it depends on whether we're working as a function of energy and angular momentum or temperature and omega. Okay. Excellent. Uh, th through this talk, I will largely be interested in the microcanonical ensemble, though I will sometimes use the canonical ensemble as a technical device. Uh, okay, great. Now, there is one very famous set of black holes that carry energy E and angular momentum J in ADS. These are black holes that I will call Kerr ADS black holes. They're the analog of Kerr black holes, except that they're sitting in ADS. These solutions were found one or two years after Kerr's original flat space black hole solutions in the 1960s by a physicist named Carter. And over the next two minutes, I'll tell you some, I, I'll give you some, uh, I will tell you a little bit about the properties of these black holes. Okay. So, um, I am going to be uh, labeling things by the energy and the angular momentum. So the first question you can ask is this. Always these energy and angular momentum are in units of n square. So it's G times energy, where G is Newton's constant, and G times angular momentum that really appeared on these, on these graphs. I won't write the G all that. Okay. First question you can ask is the following. Um, do you have black holes at all energies and angular momentum? Now, already without doing any calculations, you know that there cannot be black holes at all energies and angular momentum. Because conformal field theories obey a unitarity bound. The unitarity bound in a conformal field theory in three dimensions tells you E is greater than or equal to J. Okay. 
If you take away the vacuum state, you can make it a little bit better. E is greater than or equal to j plus half. Okay, but you know, all our E's and J's are of order n squared, so shifts of order one will not matter for us. Okay, so E is greater than or equal to J is just a unitarity statement in conformity. So it had better be that there are no black holes with energies lower than the angular momentum. Otherwise, that would have violated unitarity of the conformity. Okay. Now, if you actually look at the black holes that are constructed, it's sort of interesting. The black holes all always lie above the C is equal to J line, but they do more. They always lie above a curve that looks something like this. Okay, so what do I mean by this? Suppose I have a black hole at some energy and angular momentum. And I take that black hole and I keep its energy, angular momentum fixed, I start lowering its energy. Okay, as I do that, as the energy goes lower and lower, the black hole goes near, lower, nearer and nearer to extremality. And at some point, the black hole becomes extremer. That's this yellow line. Black holes have become extremer on this yellow curve. Below that, there are no black, no regular black holes, no black holes without naked singular. Okay. Already there's something a little odd about this curve. There's this beautiful field theory reason not to have black holes below the white line. Curve radius black holes don't exist below the white line, but they also don't exist be below a higher curve. Might already feel a little funny. Why is that the case? Is this a prediction that the quantum that the field theory doesn't have order n square states? above this higher thing, what is the field theory explanation? It's already a slightly funny fact. Okay, but not a clear contradiction. And let's move on. Okay. Now, in this line of black holes, in this space of black holes, there is another curve that is also very interesting. I'm going to draw this curve like this. This is the curve that marks the point where the black holes have omega equals one. What is omega? Omega is what people colloquially call the rotational velocity of the black hole at the event horizon. Uh, more clearly what it is, is this. If you look at this black hole as contributing to a canonical ensemble, the, this black hole contributes to an ensemble which has e, uh, trace e to the power minus beta e plus beta omega j. Okay, so black holes which contribute to this ensemble uh, uh, set to uh, have angular velocity omega. Okay, so it's the chemical potential for, with respect to rotations for the black hole. Okay, so black holes here, uh, this, this blue line marks the point where omega becomes equal to. Okay, now why have I marked this out as special? I've marked this out as special because there is a very interesting fact about about rotating black holes. This interesting fact is that black holes with omega greater than one in ADS space cannot be stable. Okay, this is a fact that has been proved, uh, you know, in a theorem type paper where Boyle is one of the authors. So people who like theorems can look at that paper. But I'm going to explain why it's true to you. Okay. The reason that this uh, for this instability is basically the phenomenon of superradiance, and uh, uh, was made sort of famous in the study of hairy black holes about uh, 14 years ago. So I'm going to first tell it to you in the context of these uh, rotating black holes, and then I will remind you how it connects with the charged black hole story, which Loga and Shantani worked worked on in the old days. Um, First, start with a black hole in flat space. So I've got this black hole in flat space here. And imagine that you have a wave incident in this black hole. This wave is a spherical wave. It carries angular momentum uh, L, let's say angular momentum J. This is in the JZ direction, same, same direction as omega, as the, as the rotation of the black hole. The black hole has, um, uh, the black hole has uh, uh, chemical potential for rotation, this angular velocity omega, and it has temp inverse temperature beta. This mode carries angular momentum j, z, j, and it has frequency uh, e to the power i omega t, that frequency, i f, I'm going to call it f, because we've already got omega, omega is used for something else. Okay, so the frequency of this wave as seen at infinity, is f. Now, I've got this wave and I have an incident on the black hole. 
And I ask, when I do this, this is a sort of scattering experiment. I send something in, I watch what comes out. I ask, how much comes in compared to what I sent? How much comes out compared to what I sent in? Now, since this guy is a blank hole, you might suspect that the answer is that less comes out than what you sent in. And if you were doing this experiment with a short chill black hole, that answer is always correct. However, for rotating black holes, it was discovered already, I think, by 1970s, Eldovich. Okay, that if F omega, sorry, J omega is greater than F, if this condition is obeyed, then when you do this experiment, the amplitude of the wave that comes out is enhanced rather than, than depleted by the fact that you're scattering off a black hole. More comes out than, when you, than what you sent in. Okay, this wave is a way of getting energy out of this rotating black hole. It's the same as the Penrose. It's Penrose is some classical. It's the same same condition, same condition, and it's the same reason that this ergosphere, blah 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 thing. But it just happens as a part of the solution to the wave equation. You just solve the wave equation and see this. Okay. Now that's a little odd, right? Because it tells you that sending this wave onto the black hole is a way of getting energy out of it. But in flight space, that's a one-off process. This wave comes, hits the black hole, extracts a little bit of energy, and goes off to infinity. In ADS, on, on the other hand, suppose you've got a small rotating black hole in ADS. Okay? The wave, you send a wave in, it goes, hits the black hole, bounces off, then hits the ADS ball, reflects, bounces back on the black hole, extracts a little more energy, reflects, and so on. So you see that this process in ADS triggers an exponential instability, an exponentially growing mode. Okay? So if you ever have a mode in ADS, at least for now when the black hole is small, I'll soon argue for you that it's true without this restriction. At least when the black hole is small so that you can use flat space intuition. Okay? Um, in ADS, if you send such a mode onto the black hole, that mode is exponentially unstable if this condition is obeyed. Now, let's try to see when this condition is obeyed. Okay. Which is the smallest value of omega for which such a condition is obeyed? Please. It's exponential because you see a certain amount, what, what, is, what is taken out of the black hole is a, is a fraction from each scattering process is a fraction of what goes in. Okay. So in, there's a time scale, which is this reflec reflection time. Every reflection time, that same fra extra fraction is taken out. So it's like compound interest. So it's exponential. Is, it, is this clear? Okay, so it's one plus something small to the power number of hits, which is yeah, linear and time. Okay. Great. So now how do, how do I try to figure out when this condition is, is violated? Okay. Now, this... You see, what we are looking for is omega, when omega is greater than F by, uh, by J, this condition will be violated. So the modes with the smallest value of F by J are the ones that will first trigger this instability. Okay? Because if there's any mode that's unstable, the black hole is unstable. The mode where it first happens is the mode with the smallest value of F by J. Okay, now let's look at this F by J. Say the black hole is small. So we can imagine that it's a, it's a small perturbation on what's happening to modes. Okay, then F by J is F by J just in pure ADS space. F is the energy of the mode. J is the angular momentum of the mode. But we can easily understand what these, 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 this ratio is by using the state operator map. So let's say that I had, let's say, a scalar field of dimension delta. Okay. For every mode of the scalar field, there is a corresponding operator. I, now let's consider the operator, which is del z to the power n o. Okay. This guy here has f equals n plus delta, but j z equals n. So f by j is equal to n plus delta divided by n. Clearly, the smallest value of this happens at infinity and is, is equal to 1 when n is in. The smallest value is 1 when n goes to infinity. In fact, 
It's impossible for any, any mode to have this ratio smaller than one. That is simply the unitarity bound that I've told you about before. No mode can have energy less than its angular moment. Okay? So it's impossible for any mode to have f by j less than one. f by j equals one is, a, is achieved in a limiting sense, as I've just shown you. Okay? And therefore, you should expect that these black holes go unstable and omega equals one. Is this clear? Yeah, at least naively. You know, there is this gray body factor potential which could lead to some thing, but I believe that it, it does not happen in plasma. Yes. Okay, great. Now, now that we've understood this, 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 this instability, we can also see which modes should be maximally responsible for this instability. Okay, you see that this instability is first triggered by these modes with an infinite number of derivatives infinite amount of angular momentum. Okay, so it's those modes that look like they should play, modes with very high angular momentum, very high energy, look like they should play a, an important role in the physics of these, uh, in the physics of this, the super radiant instability. Okay, and because of that, this analysis is actually correct, even for black holes that are not small, uh, that are not small in, in, in units of ADS. The main thing is this, that as long as the modes themselves are unaffected by the presence of this black hole, okay, this analysis is essentially true. But modes with very large angular momentum live very far away from ADS. In fact, a mode with angular momentum L lives dominantly, has almost zero amplitude up to R, the radial R coordinate being square root of L. We will encounter the statement again in this work. Okay, so since the dominant physics of this instability happens at very large angular momentum, this dominant physics happens for modes that are extremely far away from the black hole. So this decoupling between the modes and the, and, and the black hole is true uh, parametrically, not because the black hole is small, but just because the nature of the instability, because it's high angular momentum. Okay, so this condition turns out to be exactly true, not just for small black holes. Yes. Z component, yes. You, you could have such a mode, you could have such a mode. Ah, so firstly, yeah, right. Uh, you could have such a mode. Uh, now, if you have such a mode, um, in fact, you, you know, what we will do, for instance, in, in, in what we do, we will get contributions from all these modes. But what is sort of important is this twist of this mode. Okay. Um, this delta minus any, any mode, you see, what, what is important is that these modes don't have very large twist. Uh, these large, very large delta minus j. Okay, so you are going to get contributions from all modes that have small twists. So, for instance, the stress tensor will contribute the same amount as as these guys. But in gravity, the only small twist modes we have are spin two and lower. Okay, so you will get contributions from all modes that have that that occur in gravity. But you know, you don't have like a spin five guy in gravity. Okay. Those other guys are very high twist and they will be very suppressed. Their contribution will be very suppressed, those string states, as we will self consistently see. Okay, excellent. Please go on. Yes. Yeah, as long as it has this property that it extracts some of the angular momentum out of the uh, angular momentum and energy out of it, it doesn't matter what it is. Okay. Excellent. Okay. So now, uh, because of this, because of this, this diagram here is not reliable under the blue curve. Black holes, these curved ADS black holes exist here, but they're unstable. So surely they cannot represent the, end, the thermal equilibrium of the system and angular momentum J and energy. 
Okay. The question that, so up to here, there is no reason to believe that we do not know the entropy of uh, our system as a function of ENG. Be between the blue curve and the yellow curve, it's clear that if all we know is curve ADS black hole, we do not know the answer to the question. What is the entropy of the field theory as a function of ENG? Okay. So the question we're going to ask uh, in this talk is what is the answer to this question? What is the entropy of these? Of uh, 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 what, what is the entropy of the, of the boundary field theories in this region? And as you will see, actually, we will find an answer in this whole region, all the way down to the unitary block. The point was this. Yeah, okay, so let me let me explain that point by giving you a, uh, another example where something like this works, but not quite. The other example is super radiance for charged black holes. You see, the con there's a similar phenomenon for charged black holes where the condition turns out to be mu times E is greater than F. If you've got an, a black hole with chemical potential mu, you've got a mode with, energy, uh, with charge E and uh, frequency F, then such a mode obey uh, is super radiantly unstable if mu times E is greater than F. Okay, now, for this, for this mode, you might therefore, because of this, you might therefore think that the condition uh, goes for a scalar operator which has charge E would go some, somewhat something like this. A scalar operator of charge E has lowest energy state equals delta by the same kind of reasoning. Okay, so you might think that the condition would be mu times E is greater than delta. Okay, that, that would be super radiant instability from the scalar if this condition was, was true. This is not exactly right. It's true when the black hole is very small, because then this analysis is perfectly, perfectly justified. But you see, when the black hole becomes bigger, the black hole and the mode mix with each other. Okay, so even this question of what is F for this mode is affected by the black hole. Okay, what, not, not J, but what, what is F of, of the, so the condition becomes an ambiguous condition because it's not a separated system between mode and black hole. In flat space, it was always separated because we had an asymptotic infinity. The great thing is for this angular momentum problem, E is always separated because even though we don't have asymptotic infinity, these, the modes that participate in this instability live very far away. Is this clear? Okay, excellent. Now that we started talking about this charge business, let me briefly remind you what so this charge kind of instability was studied in great detail 10 or 15 years ago, okay? And because in this situation, let's say the black hole was small. So we've got ADS and we've got a small black hole in ADS so that this analysis is approximately correct. You see the mode that first goes unstable is the mode with F equals delta. That is a particular wave function. It's the mode corresponding to the primary operator. And so, what you might think will happen is that the end point will be this black hole sitting inside a condensate of the scalar field in the wave function corresponding to F equals delta, the primary scalar field. And indeed, this is the case. This is something that Logash, Anthony, and I, and others demonstrated in great detail, uh, you know, 12 years ago. In fact, since... Logan and Shantini were on the paper. I think we have expansions up to 20th order in, in, in E, maybe 37th order. Right? Okay, you know, okay. So, um, so the, this is indeed the case, but we also see that. So, so the two things I wanted to say. First, that we see that that condition is approximate because we know the right condition is order by order and perturbation theory. Second, we know qualitatively what, this, what the solution was. It was a black hole sitting inside a burst condensate of one mode, the mode that first went unstable. Now, when this hairy black hole story became popular 10, 15 years ago, there was this obvious question which was raised, which is, what is the angular momentum counterpart of this story? And the question was never answered precisely for the reason that we, we have now reviewed. Namely, it was a very clean story for the charge guy. Because one mode goes unstable, it's going to be populated like hell. 
you know, in, in a Bose condensed way, and uh, it will interact with the black hole. That's a very clean story. But here, which mode gets populated? See, the first mode that gets populated is at infinity. So if your omega is such that modes from 1 million onwards are unstable, then the guy at 1 million should be occupied, but so, so should the guy at 1 million plus 1, and so should the guy at 1 million plus 2, all the way up to infinity. There's never a situation where a finite number of modes are unstable. Okay? So it felt like a different problem and was not very, very much addressed. Okay. Uh, I'm going to try in this talk to, to give you a proposal for what the correct answer is uh, in, the, in the situation. Uh, the last sort of introduction. Yeah. It, yeah, it seems clear. I agree. Okay, it's it's certainly not a finite number of condensings. Okay, okay, um, right. And uh, uh, the last uh, sort of introductory comment I, I will make before going on to our proposal um, in this talk is uh, uh, a comment about uh, about another way of viewing this problem. There is another way of viewing this problem that the GR people like. And they, they ask the question as follows. They ask, what is the end point of the dynamical process triggered by the superradiant instability? You see, I've got some black hole here. This is a good starting condition, initial state for GR. Now, if we do classical GR and I start really with this black hole, we sit on the top of the hill forever, nothing else. But if we perturb it with one of these instabilities, the, mode, the solution will start rolling. Presumably, it will in some sense eventually settle down to something. What does it settle down into? Of course, we are not going to do any time dependence in this, in this, in this, uh, in this talk, but uh, presumably it will settle down into its thermodynamically favored state. We're going to try to make a proposal for the thermodynamically favored state. Okay. Qu any, any other questions or comments before we turn more technical? Yes. 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 Uh, so that doesn't have any special. Uh, uh, I mean, is it, if you were somehow sitting on the extremal curve, uh, 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 is there something special that happens for? Uh, I mean, the, yeah. Uh, uh, excellent question. Actually, the answer is yes. Uh, at least uh, this question we have analyzed carefully in the charged case. So I will tell you the answer there. I presume it's the same. Um, you see, there are two mechanisms for instability for this extremal case. Okay. The first mechanism is the superradiant kind of instability that I talked about. Okay. And then there is a second mechanism that, at least on the face of it, looks a bit different. And the second mechanism is that. Uh, uh, Extremely black holes have this ADS2 throat. And any field, you take a field that is in ADS4 and dimensionally reduce it on ADS2. Okay? You get a bunch of fields that propagate in ADS2. Now, any field that lies below the ADS2 Brighton Lona Friedman bound will trigger an instability. And since this instability is entirely happening within this ADS2 region, it feels qualitatively different from this dub, 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 dub kind of thing, because it's just an ADS2 kind of thing. Okay, and in fact, in the case of the charged black holes, in a paper that I can't remember who the authors were, but perhaps with Santos and friends, uh, we demonstrated that there is a kink in this, um, that there is a kink in the in, in the condition for the instability along the um, along the uh, superadiant line. So what, what we did was the following: we looked at a black a black holes of charge E, and asked as a function of let's say this J of the black hole. What is the minimum E uh, that you need for your field in order for the uh, black hole to go un unstable? Okay, and uh, we demonstrated that there was a kink in this curve. This is E versus J, uh, E versus this Q. This thing is some something which has a kink at some point. You know, non-analyticity at some point. Below this, there's the superalien kind of. This is an here. This can be correctly computed as an analytic continuation of this small small thing, which is superadian. Here, the condition was just analytically, analytically obtained from this ADS2 condition. 
And these were not analytic continuations of each other. So for large extremal black holes, the nature of the instability qualitatively changes. I would, I, nobody, I don't think anyone's done the analysis, but I, the phenomenon seems so generic that I think it's true. It'll, it'll be true. So, but then below that? Um, or... You see, I don't think it'll make any difference because below this, as you will see, a new phase takes over. So this was never really relevant. So below this, the extremality is washed away. Okay, it was always an unstable minimum, you know, maximum. It was not, not relevant. The nature of the instability changes, but that, yeah, yeah. Okay, at least as far as we, we can tell. Okay, excellent. Any other questions or comments? Okay, so let's proceed. Okay, um, you know, some of the audience was, has heard me speak before, Shayantani and, and Alok and so on. Partly in order to give you a little variety, I'm going to vary the method of my presentation. Both of you I've talked to about in the canonical ensemble, we will try to present today from the micro capacity. Okay. Um, okay, so now look, suppose I've got a black hole uh, I mean, the logic will be in the microcanonical ensemble, the calculations may no, proceed canonically. Suppose I've got this black hole in ABS. The first thing to remember is that this black hole always Hawking radiates. Okay. So the black hole always Hawking radiates. It's never, you wait long enough, you never have only black hole. You have black hole plus Hawking radiation. Okay. When we're interested in black holes at large n, in the large end theory, we, all, we basically ignore this. Why do we ignore it? We ignore it because the black hole has energy n square, or angular momentum n square, whereas the Hawking radiation gas is a gas of a 10 dimensional the theory um, in a box of size one, and so carries energy and angular momentum and all other thermodynamic quantities of order one. Okay. So if we were sensitive enough to worry about one over n square corrections to black hole thermodynamics, we'd have to keep track of the gas. But you know, we're not so ambitious. We are simple people. We want to work in the large end limit. So we ignore the gas. Now you can ask, is it always, is it always possible to ignore the gas? Is it always correct for us to ignore the gas? Well, the first thing that we have to ask ourselves is what are the properties of this gas? You see, this gas is in thermal equilibrium with the black hole, okay? The properties of this gas near this event horizon, let's say up to 10 Schwarzschild radius away, it's complicated because it's moving in some complicated background. And uh, in Euclidean space, the time circle is shrinking. But once you go far enough away, once you go far enough away from the black hole, the gas is basically propagating in ADS space. So some gas propagating in ADS space, and what are its thermodynamic properties? Well, it's in equilibrium with the black hole. So it has to have the same thermodynamic potentials as the black hole. So it has to have the same temperature as the black hole and the same angular velocity as the black hole. Okay. So if we are going to allow ourselves to ignore some finite region around the black hole, what we have is a gas in ADS at temperature, inverse temperature beta and angular velocity omega. Is this clear? Fine. At generic values of beta and omega, everything we said was correct. The angular momentum and energy of the gas is order one. No, no issue. Question, does something special happen as happen to this gas as omega goes to one? No. This black hole could be 10 times the size of ADS. This box will be a million times the size of ADS. Everything of interest will happen to us, parametrically large values have R, so it will not matter. Okay, excellent. Okay, question, does something special happen to the thermal gas in ADS as omega goes to one? And is that special thing reliable in, for our situation in the, sense, in the sense that does it happen essentially at very large values of R? Okay, now this is a trivial question to us. It's a trivial question to answer because the computation of the uh, partition function of the gas is a trivial computation. Okay, let me do it for you 
for the case of a scale, uh, minimally coupled scalar field. Okay, let's consider a minimally coupled scalar field of uh, of, dim uh, of uh, dimension delta. I'm always going to use state operator map just because it trivializes the question of finding the spectrum of this theory in ADS. Okay, so what do we have here? What are all the operators of this theory? Well, this operator can have some number of del squares, let's call that N, and some number of Zs, let's call that M, uh, J, uh, del, del mu's, let's call that M, okay? Where these del mu's are trace removed. They contracted with, you know, some tensor which is traceless. And this is the full spectrum of operators that you can make out of derivatives acting on a scalar field. You can act with derivatives in any way you want, and all I've done is, is remove the trace part out and treat that as spectrum. The reason I remove the trace part out is that it doesn't contribute to angular momentum. Okay, so if I take all the descendants of this operator uh, of dimension delta, and I want to write down the spectrum of operators that I get as a function of dimension and angular momentum, so the, you know, break it up into the full content operator by operator, not primary by primary. We've just done it, right? We get, so if we label operators with dimension, uh, let's, I'm going to say E and J, this is scaling dimension and angular momentum. This series of modes has scaling dimension delta plus 2N plus M. Let's call this L, so you remember it's an angular moment. L, and it has angular momentum L. Okay, and the sequence is true for, you know, it's summed over n is equal to one to infinity and l is equal to one to infinity. This is the full operator content of the tower headed by a primary of dimension delta. You see, this is one other nice thing of working in D equals three. When I say angular momentum L, uh, we don't mean some sophisticated thing with some number of young tab boxes in the young tableau. We mean what we learned as undergraduates. It's angular momentum L, L because it's SO3. It's a very simple thing. Okay. Now, this is a whole multiplet of angular momentum L, but the states in this multiplet can be labeled by the JZ component of angular momentum. Let's call that A. Okay. Let's say that JZ for this guy, JZ is equal to L minus, I think we called it A in the paper. Meaning the Z component of angular momentum is L minus A. So A is how far below the maximum maximum Z component that you could have, okay? So if I did this final labeling, I'll put A here as well, and I'll have A being summed from zero to two L. Okay, now this is, there are no multiplets anymore. These are just operators, one component operators. This is full spectrum of operators. Now suppose I want to compute the, the partition function of my gas. Suppose I want to compute this partition function of the gas that is in this thermal equilibrium with, uh, uh, with this black hole. Well, what do I do? My partition function is a product. You see, there's both statistics here. So when you compute these partition functions, you shouldn't think particle by particle, but state by state. Each of these states is a harmonic oscillator. So the product of harmonic oscillator partition functions, one for each of these states. In terms of log of partition function, log z minus log z is equal to sum over uh, l, n, and a log of e to the power minus beta. Now we want the energy. Uh, and the energy was delta plus 2n plus l. Okay. Plus beta omega, and we want the angular momentum. So the angular momentum was l minus a. Okay, and we have to do the summation over N, L, and A over the ranges written here. The, no, log is inside the sum because the product, a product over many modes becomes sums over logs. Okay, great. So this is some, some gas. You see, there's no N square anywhere here. So some order one thing. This is justifying what we said earlier. This is some order one partition function. 
what that i did minus log minus minus log z because it's one over something so that puts the minus so ah oh, thank you one minus thank you log log of one minus okay now you can ask does anything special happen to this uh to this uh, this partition function as uh, uh, omega goes to 1 the first thing you might fear is that one of these terms will become 1 or exceed 1 as omega becomes 1 let's look at that this thing here is omega equals 1 okay and uh, to uh, that you see never happens because this omega l cancels this l okay so this term here always has a negative thing so let's write this out at omega equals one e to the power minus beta okay so now the l term cancels but we get minus delta plus 2n plus a these are all positive so the second term is always a number smaller than one. So no one of these terms diverges as omega goes to one. This is actually a reflection of the, of the unitarity bound of the field theory. You never have a mode with E equals A, E equals J. There's no single mode in your theory with E equals J. So individual modes are always well behaved even when omega is equal to one. Clear? However, the next question you can ask, is okay maybe individual modes are well behaved as omega equals one but what about the sum is the sum well behaved as omega equals one and now look at this you see the suppression this boltzmann suppression factor here depends on n and a but l has disappeared when omega is equal to one. this means that whatever happens for any let's do the sum over l first clearly we get infinity because we have an infinite sum over all terms all of which are the same Okay, so clearly this partition function diverges as at omega equals one. Okay, even though no particular mode diverges, so the contribution to no particular mode diverges as, as at omega equals one. Okay, now let's try to be a little, little more quantitative. Since this divergence is appearing at large values of n, it's justified to turn the sum in order to characterize the leading divergence we can turn the sum in sum over l into an integral because at large values of l the difference between the sum and the integral is negative okay so let's go back to this formula and write it as minus log z is equal to sum over n and a that's where integral dl log of one minus e to the power minus beta okay now uh, we want to sort of uh, uh, single out the L dependence in this part. Uh, A also goes from 0 to 2L, that is correct. But L will be so large, A will effectively go to infinity because there is a severe Boltzmann suppression for A. A is equal to 10 already contributes almost not. Okay. L is going to be, go up to infinity for the. Yeah, so, for, so great question, Naveen. And uh, uh, in this large, in this asymptotic limit, we can even replace the sum over A to infinity. Okay. So we have e to the power minus. Now, look at the L suppression. The L suppression comes from here, this beta omega and beta uh, L. So we have e to the power minus beta uh, 1 minus omega into L. Okay. And then there is the contribution from a and n for the a and n contributions i'm just going to set it omega equals one because omega is going to be very near to one okay so this will be e to the power minus beta a uh, plus 2n plus delta effectively we can be a little more precise more or less this is correct okay now that we've made this an integral let's change variables so let's call this guy x beta one minus omega l is equal to x Okay, and so we say that minus log z is equal to integral uh, n a. Now this, this is the important point. We get a one over beta one minus omega. 
This is from the change of variables. We have changed it from dl to d of this x. Okay, uh, sum over n and a, an integral dx log of one minus e to the power minus beta x times this other, uh, minus beta a plus two n plus delta. Is this clear? Okay. This is a finite object, which is independent of omega. All the omega dependences come out in front of our eyes. And so we see that this partition function, log z minus log z, goes like one over one minus omega times some known finite one. This is the nature of the divergence of the partition function as omega goes to one and diverges. Okay. Great. This is the this is one way of thinking of the physical reason for why these black holes don't exist at omega greater. These black holes have to be in equilibrium with the gas. The gas does not exist at omega greater than one. So these black holes, you can write them down in, in, in classical Einstein general relativity, but they're nonsense for omega greater than one. Because the gas with, with, with which they're in equilibrium is giving you a divergent contribution. Okay, now let's examine it more closely. Let's examine the limit to omega goes to one. As omega goes to one, this, uh, the, the free energy of this gas, and therefore, as we will see, the angular momentum, and uh, let's immediately see that. If I want to compute the angular momentum coming out of this, this gas, I would differentiate z with respect to omega. And dif that differentiation process, uh, procedure turns this into one over one minus omega, the whole thing square. Time something fixed. Okay. Now, uh, that's great. So we see that the partition function diverges like one over one minus omega. The energy and energy and angular momentum up to uh, are equal to each other uh, at this order. You can easily check that. Physically, that's clear because all these modes have energy more or less equal to angular momentum, right? All the modes that are contributing dominantly. So the energy and angular momentum are order one over one minus omega square, whereas partition function is what it is, would play a big role in this gas. So as you take omega to one, if you take one minus omega is like one over n, then what? Energy is to get by derivative of beta. Not quite, because you also have to subtract, when you take derivative with respect to beta, you get uh, E minus omega j. And then you have to subtract out this part. So the term that was derivative with respect to beta is just one over one minus omega. But this term is one over one minus omega square. Okay, so that, that term that you were talking about is the cor correction to the twist. Okay, and the subleading. Okay, um, excellent. So, um, okay, so, now, suppose we have one minus omega uh, is of order one by n. In that case, we will have E of order J is equal to of order N square. Same order as the energy and angular momentum in the black hole. So before you reach omega equals one, as you're raising omega, you will reach omega is equal to one minus one over N. At this point, you cannot ignore the contribution of the gas to your system. So when omega is within one over n of one, the gas is not a subdominant contribution to your system anymore. It contributes on equal footing to the thermodynamics of your system. This is the mistake you've been making. Okay. So in the rest of this talk, now, uh, you see, I never exceed the time I'm given, so somebody should tell me. Give me a realistic deadline. Don't, don't say 12, 30, be, be reasonable. <laughs> uh, you, you tell me like what time is? 12.45. 12.45. 12 <laughs> skimpy, skimpy. <laughs> what? <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Excellent. So, um, uh, uh, but I'll try 12.45-ish, let's see. So, uh, so as we approach, we're gonna have a new solution. The new solution includes the effect of both the black hole and the gas. Okay, 
Now we're going to compute this new solution in two steps. First, we're going to make this ridiculous sounding assumption. Okay. You see, once you have a new solution, you need a new solution. Because if the gas has energy, half of the black hole, it doesn't look like it's going to be a small perturbation to the space-time metric of the black hole. So it looks like you need a new solution. Okay. But let us first assume that, you know, we're going to be really crude. You know, we're going to... We're going to be like phenomenologists. So forget it. Suppose the properties are going are the sum of the properties of the black hole and the gas in ADS. In that case, what would we get? What would we get for the thermodynamics? Uh, I'm saying all this because I will show you in the end that parametrically in large n, the properties of our solution will be the sum of the gas of the black hole. So I will have to convince you of that. Fact. But let's assume that for a moment and see what we get. Then we can go back to our, uh, okay. So what about our properties of our gas? Properties of our gas were that E was equal to J was, was order one over one minus omega square. Log Z you remember was of order one over one minus omega. And if, because of this, if you compute the entropy, you find that the entropy is also order one over one minus omega. Okay, so it's an interesting situation. For two thermod, if one minus omega is one, one over n, energy and angular momentum are same order as the black hole, but entropy is not. This is a general feature. Entropy of a gas never computes with the entropy of the black hole. Right? This is black hole entropy kept always parametrically larger than a gas at the same energies. This is always true in, in ADS CFT. Okay? So this new component. We're still just above the line, just above the line. But eventually you want to go below or? No, we will never go, okay, we, in EMA, no, so you will see in a minute. We're, we're not, we're, the black hole is just above the line, but the full solution is not above the line. So it will be below, below the line. Below the line. Yes. Explain what, what it explain what we want. Yes, yeah. downstairs. Yes. Okay. And so it, could there be a regime, I mean, there would be a regime where uh, maybe it won't back react, but it can shed some d brain when it is one minus omega is of order one over root n. Uh, uh, would oh. there be something there? Uh, yeah, or oh, you might even wonder whether it could uh, do that with a black hole, like a small black hole outside, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it does not happen. Uh, uh, I, I will explain this at the end of the talk. You mean it's always entropically summed up. Those configurations. Uh, but but, the no, reason, but before this onset of this, ah, uh, when it is of order one over root n, that's be much before one over n, right? Yeah. Uh, so okay. so uh, you see, there are the kinds of B-brains that, that are basically giant gravitons. Yeah. Those are accounted for here. Maybe some of all gravitons giant or, or not. Hmm. Okay. Um, the kind of thing that you're... Um, uh, so, uh, if it was some, if it was some you know some kind of d brain that was ha, had not was not bps it's not, had some high twist that will always be subdominant what you need are states with e nearly equal to j okay however you make these states all of those states will contribute but those states at least we believe the d brains that are of those forms have a description in terms of gravitons right? mm -hmm. there is puffed up gravitons was that what you had in mind yeah, uh, so I, um, yeah, I had in my end, it, you would still have a divergence, but it would be milder than the one. Uh, I, I think you, for the divergence, you need the modes to have E equals J. A mode that has E much larger than J. No, this would also have E. If it has E, e equals minor, uh, Yeah, E, my, uh, is e minus J is very small. Very small. Yeah. You need modes with E minus J is being. It's small. Small. Yeah. Yes. And you need a sequence of such words. E minus J is any number is not divergent by itself. Every mode is like that because of unitarity. You need a sequence of modes like that. Now, if E minus J is some very large number, those modes don't contribute. Right? Because those are Boltzmann suppressed. The whole those are the yeah, minus these N's and A's. The whole point here is that modes with E minus J are not Boltzmann suppressed. E is equal to J, not Boltzmann suppressed. All those modes you have to keep. Now, there is 
some, there are some graviton type modes that are of that sort. They may admit a dual description in terms of D-brains, but we're keeping them anyway. The graviton spectrum. The heavy D-brain modes, I don't think we'll have it. Okay, there is a version of your question though that goes this way. What, I'll come to this in the end. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it, the version of the question is what, what if the gas, can't you increase your entropy by collapsing the gas into small black holes that rotate? Uh, then there's a version of this question that the answer is no, you cannot. But I'll come to that at the end. If that's it. Yeah, because there it's dangerous. Because even though these modes don't quite have E equals J, they carry extra entropy because of the horizon area of the entropy. But without that horizon area, there's no competition. Without that extra. Yes. Slightly different way of yes. putting what you're doing. Yes. Uh, if you have this black hole solution to yes. the regime. Yes. And uh, you are basically now trying to do perturbation theory. Yes. Part, yes. And you will compute a determinant. Yes. Zero modes, zero modes. Yes. This is what this is, and that competes. Yes. Yes, absolutely. So in our paper, we have two sections. Explanation from microcanonical point of view, explanation from canonical point of view. This is the canonical explanation. But uh, for Shantani and uh, Alok, I thought I would do the second examples. In the last time, I presented it this way. So, just so that they don't get bored. Oh, they get less bored. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, yeah. So we have an explanation exactly along those lines also. Fine. Okay. So now, let's see. Suppose we just take this sum of direct sum, then how do things go? Now, as I responded to one of Rajesh's questions, um, extremality will play no role in the story. So I'm just going to ignore the line that I think I drew as yellow. I won't even draw it. Anymore. But omega equals one is very important. Let's see. Now let's answer Ashok's question. Ashok's question was, where do these black holes, these, these things sit? <coughs> if we assume that the thermodynamics is just a direct sum. Some of them have a non-interactive mix. I will justify this to you. Of the black hole and the, and the gas. Then it's very easy. Because you see the gas carries E equals J. So suppose you are at a point here. You are at a point here. This energy cannot be obtained by just a black hole. Because all legal black holes sit above this blue line. But it can be obtained if you draw a 45 degree line and go just below this blue line. Because now we've got a black hole that is legal in equilibrium with the gas. Why 45 degree? 45 degree because the gas carries E equals J. So whatever energy, extra energy you have in the gas, it is start from the black hole you're in and make a 45 degree line. Okay. Assuming this non-interacting mixed picture, every point that can be accomplished starting from can be reached starting from this, essentially the blue line and going on a 45 degree line, we have one of these solutions. But because this white line is a 45 degree line, that is every point between the blue curve and this white curve. Okay, so these new solutions we're creating lie in this region, the region between the blue and the, the white line. The excess energy and angular momentum is made up by the gas and it is given by this construction. This construction also gives you the answer for the entropy of this. Because remember that the entropy of the gas was subdomed. So all of the entropy of these solutions comes from the black hole in the center. So if you want to know what the entropy of E equals J is here at leading order and larger, you draw this, you make this construction. Where it hits this blue curve, it's the entropy of that. Okay. This became as I'm going to be our final answer for the question I posed at the beginning of this talk. What is the entropy of field theory as a function of E and J? Above the blue curve, it's given by curve radius black hole. Below the blue curve is also given by, by some omega equals one curve radius black hole. Which omega equals one curve radius black hole? You need to make this construction. Is, is this clear, Ashok? Okay. Excellent. So now I've even given you the answer to the entropy question. But um, I, the answer sounds like it's using a ridiculous approximation. Because I'm pretending that the black hole is not affected by turning black hole space time is essentially not affected by turning on a very large amount of, uh, by having, having contribution from a very large amount of gas that carries about half of its energy. That sounds ridiculous. Un it sounds ridiculous, but it's true. Let me explain to you why, why this is the case. 
Yes, it's just because of that J. Uh, that's the qualitative explanation. Yes, and I will try to make that more quantitative. It's far away. It's far away. So everything that is there is far away and is so far away that it does not affect the metric near the near and near the and near the black hole. But uh, you know, this is a slightly dangerous game. So it needs some formulas to justify. Uh, because there are many things that could happen. Right. Now all galaxy up there is a black hole at the center and mass of the galaxy is much larger than the mass of the black. Right? But you don't care. Yeah, we don't care. Yeah, it's basically that. It's basically that. It's basically that. It's basically that. Okay. The one thing though is that, yeah, it's basically that. It's just that, that in the end, your boundary stress tensor will see the energy of everything, including the gas. Yeah, it's basically. It's basically. A little strange, but okay. I'm going to give you a slightly more careful gravity uh, justification on this fact, but it's what you're saying. Okay, now by very close, you have to tell me whether it's very close in order one or very close in one, uh, one by n. If we're near this white line of order one by n, then we are reaching a very small black hole that will be order, will be quantum. Okay, and then we don't know what's going on. Then I think this higher spin analysis that people do in CFT will actually be what's going on. It'll be the, uh, you know, you'll have to take into account some gas of these multi-trace operators with anomalous dimensions. I think the black hole will be a little unserious. But if we very small but large than compared to one over n, then everything's okay. Okay. Yes. Uh, maybe it's confusion. Uh, you said the solution will be the uh, that point, uh, the black hole at that point of intersection, plus the additional energy coming from the gas. Yeah. But uh, that black hole at that point of intersection has a different entropy from what. It uh, what the current ADS entropy does, yes, it does, and it's always greater. And it's always greater. greater, it's always greater. Okay, let me explain that to you. Um, you see, um, there is this basic formula of thermodynamics, uh, that tells you what happens to the entropy, okay, when you change the energy of it and the angular momentum. Okay, uh, and that tells you that delta S is equal to delta E by, uh, by temperature plus delta J uh, minus delta J by temperature times omega. Okay. So now, suppose I have a black hole and I change its angular momentum and energy along this line. That is changing angular momentum and energy such that energy is equal to angular momentum. So this term, I'm going to decrease its energy. Ha, huh, but right, exactly. So this term will be a negative contribution because I'm decreasing energy. But this term will be a positive contribution because I mean, I'm decreasing angular momentum. And if omega is greater than one, the positive is larger than the negative. So if you move, along black holes, along this line, you're constantly increasing entropy, monotonically, until you come here. Now, if you move further, you would increase the entropy, because now omega would go greater. So on this 45 degree line, the black hole with the largest entropy is on this blue curve. Okay. Yes. Yes. Yes, we can go as far as we want, but now we you see this our diagram here is E is equal to uh, E and J. The game you play is you choose a point here and ask what is the solution. If you choose this point, you get this entropy. You choose another point, you get another entropy. But you're right, you could be here, and I'll give you the answer to the end. Okay, the blue curve is an analytically known curve because it comes from the properties of 
classical black holes and it has it's in it's it uses this property that the slope of that blue curve is always greater than one but asymptotes to one okay but this is not some assumption we just know the answer okay uh, other questions or comments okay so yes explain why, why it's yes. more rigorous i mean is the issue that because these are in equilibrium they will be bouncing back and forth these modes that's why you have to justify more well, actually maybe we should just we didn't have to justify more yeah. maybe we didn't have to justify more maybe maybe there was no need this one thing that this justification will give us it will give us a formula for the boundary stress tensor of the solution so we you know it's nice to have the whole cell in the sense that these are words it's nice to have a solution of gr that solution gr can then be used to probe the properties of the solution more okay. more accurately maybe that is instead of justifying i should just say i want to further understand this find the solution find the solution okay now you see this solution is going to be given very okay i don't have much time so i will say it largely in words okay uh this goes this way what we do is a self consistent procedure we first assume that the metric of our solution is never uh, see one other thing ashok that i want to justify is even if this thermodynamics i have to justify not just that the metric of the black hole is not changed very much but that the metric where the gas lives is not changed very much because if that was changed very much then that calculation would not be right because this is a calculation assuming the gas lives in ads so we want to assume that it's quantitatively correct we want to show that it's quantitatively correct okay yeah let me let me tell you how it goes first we're going to assume that even very far away the metric in which the gas lives is not very far from ads and we will check whether the assumption is self consistent if that's the case then this calculation is correct but something more is correct we know the full thermal state of a gas in ads okay we can compute the thermal state and compute the expectation value of the stress tensor of the gas in ads this is something we can just do so in order to show that it doesn't affect the geometry very much i mean you have to show how the sign is up exactly 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 and the dilution will be because the gas stops existing at a radius of square root n so it's the dilution is 1 by square root n it's basically that yeah yeah exactly okay so now this uh so 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 so, so let's uh, let's keep going you see what we want to do well, because we we're making this assumption of a thermal gas in ads we can compute all its properties including the expectation value of the stress tensor of the gas locally in ads actually in the paper we've done this two ways because it was a slightly complicated calculation we did it two ways to check first we did it from hamiltonian methods we just you know mode by mode computed the stress tensor and summed second we did it by euclidean methods we went to the euclidean space we computed the two point function of the scalar field uh we regulated it the way you should we took derivatives in the end we got the same answer from both methods we show we are correct okay now that stress tensor has the following property firstly as ashok was asking and as i previously said before the radius the radius to which a mode which has angular momentum l the radius where it sort of extends over where it's localized over more or less is of order square root of l okay now notice that in this formula that in this calculation here l is cut off in this sum here the reason that the sum does not diverge where right yeah the reason that the sum that does not diverge is that l is cut off at order 1 over 1 minus omega okay so at order l of order 1 over 1 minus omega uh, 1 over 1 minus omega is gives the typical scale for l in this problem so the typical scale for the radii in this problem are r of order 1 over square root of 1 minus omega okay now this turns out to be a true feature of the stress tensor we compute through careful calculation the 
stress tensor turns out to be a function of the scaled radial coordinate x where x is equal to r divided by square root of 1 over uh, sorry times 1 minus omega and also of a scaled angular coordinate theta where theta is equal to uh, pi by well, of pi by 2 minus delta theta okay suppose the angle is pi by 2 minus delta theta and delta theta is equal to square root of 1 minus omega times zeta when x is order 1 r is order 1 over square root of 1 minus omega when zeta is order 1 which one square no same sorry square root but down here yes it's fixed by scale. No, this this is theta for how much it scrunches. Yeah, which is theta? Yes, let me say that. Uh, we've got an S2. We've got omega like this, you know, hold the axis like this. Things are spinning around like that. It's how near the equator. The centrifugal force likes to push things out in radius and likes to push things towards the equator in, in theta. Okay. How near the equator does it like to push things? It turns out it likes to push things near the equator like 1 over square root f. You take a spherical harmonic at very large angular momentum, it's very near localized near the equator over what range? 1 over square root of 1 over square root of n. And so this guy, this is a new scaled variable. And the, um, the uh, stress tensor turns out to be a smooth function of x and zeta. Okay, so it blows down the radial region. You remember that one minus omega was order one over n square, no one over n. So it it, it goes to uh, it goes to radial regions of order square root n. The zeta blows down that square root n radius and makes it one, and blows up a one by square root n region near near the equator and makes that one. So that's how a gas looks. Our gas is like you should think of it like a pancake. The pancake extends to a radius of size square root n and has a thickness in theta of size 1 over uh, square root n. But you know, the proper thickness is r times that and r over square root n. So the proper thickness is more or less uniform along this pancake. So it's really like a pancake. Its, pro its thickness doesn't change as you move along, but its size tapers off after size square root n. Okay? Now, what? Like a spiral galaxy, I suppose. You should tell me. Yeah, it's like a it's like a like a disc. Yes. Yeah. Yes. 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 They are basically from them. They they basically they're from large L. Yeah. Yes. 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 So slightly different because you might, you know, uh, if it was one over n square, for instance, then the energy in the gas would have been n to the four. If it had been one over square root n, then the energy in the gas would have been n. So it would not have shown up on the phase diagram. If you want to be at any finite point on this phase diagram, Finite point away, finite distance away from the blue curve, you have to have one minus omega equals one. Omega. If it's one over square root n, then you would be on the blue curve. If it was one over n squared, you'd be at infinity. So I'm trying to get ratio of energies of black hole and gas. Yeah, independent of it. Okay, excellent. Okay, excellent. So now I, I'll go very quick on this. So the stress tensor is a smooth function of this the uh, x and zeta. Because of that, when you're solving Einstein's equations, it's good to work to change your coordinates and work in the coordinates x and zeta. And when you do that, when you work in the x zeta coordinates, now nothing is dilute anymore because you know we've scaled all distances to be order one. But the fact that the original gas was dilute shows up in the fact that the stress tensor is has an explicit factor of G Newton divided by one over. I didn't have the time to explain this properly, but anyway, T is of order G Newton divided by one minus omega. 
times some smooth function. Now remember one one minus omega is large, but is only n. Whereas G Newton is order one over n square. So there is an explicit small number behind the stress tensor. And that small number has come from the largeness of n. So in this coordinate system, all you need to ever do to leading order in n is solve linearly. So you just have to solve for, but you've got this gas stress tensor. Now you want to compute the back reacted metric because of this gas stress tensor. You only need to solve Einstein's equations linearly. This is a trivial, trivial problem. This is a problem I can do without Chantry and Loga also. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we did it. <laughs> and uh, uh, we get an answer. I won't tell you much about the answer. It's in our paper. The one thing that I want to tell you, I'm sorry, I'm already going to I'll just take two things. The one thing that I want to tell you that um, um, the one thing that I want to tell you is sort of intuitive, but interesting. We get the answer for the metric. There's a metric in our paper. It's got, it's got hypergeometric functions, whatever those are. And uh, um, uh, it's some con concrete answer. Okay. Now, you take that answer and you ask, what is the stress, boundary stress tensor due to the answer? Okay. And the boundary stress tensor is the sum of two terms. There's the stress tensor of the black hole that lives here. And there is the, stre the stress tensor coming from the change in the metric because in response to the gas. But this gas was very thin and very far away. Now, suppose you've got something that is very thin and very far away. The response to that is also very thin because it gets smeared out in ADS safety. But the smearing is only by, a, this, by an amount proportional to how near to the boundary you are. And this gas was very far away. And so this stress tensor contribution is highly localized around the equator. In fact, localized around this, this scale, which is basically square root n, one by square root n. In the large end limit, the additional stress tensor we get from, from this gas becomes delta function localized around the equator. Is that of a chiral one plus one dimensional gas living on the, exactly on the equator, delta function localized moving like this. Okay? So we have a very striking boundary prediction from this new solution. The new boundary stress tensor of this solution has a smooth part. And then at any finite end, we are, it's always smooth, but at, in the large end limit, it picks up this additional contribution, this additional energy and angular momentum is all localized exactly at the, at the equator. There's a delta function piece in the stress tensor. So it's like a boundary smoking gun for this phenomenon. Okay, This delta function piece localized at the equator, a sharp phase transition from having smooth stress tensor anyway. Okay, now in the last one, one or two minutes, I'll just say one, one last thing. Okay, this is all I want to say about gray galaxies. This we conjecture is the end point of the instability of the superradiant, uh, the superradiant instability of curved black holes. Um, there's so many things I should say, but let me once two, two things. One, one in response to Rajesh. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, let me one, say one thing in response to Rajesh. Uh, Rajesh was asking, could it be that other things other than this gas would contribute? And one fear that, um, we, that we had was this. It's very unusual in gravity for a gas to be the end point of a, uh, of a thermal ensemble, simply because gases carry no entropy Come on the scale at which black holes carry it. And so the thing that, that worried us was the following thing. We've got this gas. Now, what stops this gas from itself collapsing into small black holes that then will circle around? This doesn't work. It doesn't work because let's because this gas is completely chiral. This gas carries E equals J. If you have, let's say that we divide, we put all of its energy into some small black hole, or content of its energy into some small black hole that's orbiting around very far. Okay? That small black hole carries energy larger than angular momentum. Why? Intrinsically, it always carries energy larger than angular momentum. And then the orbital angular momentum can add derivatives to the operator. So it won't change that difference, but the difference remains constant. Now, so the gas just does not have the quantum numbers to collapse into black. The only way you can do that is by drawing some energy 
out of the central black hole to make up the energy of this black hole how that would happen i don't care about subverb hole whatever doesn't matter question is can it lower lower entropy it can draw the angular momentum equals energy out of the gas but then it needs a little more energy so it has to draw that energy out of the central black hole now that energy when you draw the energy out of the central black hole that lowers the entropy of the central black hole and there's a competition and it always you always lose this process always lowers entropy so this gas cannot collapse into black holes because it's kite if you draw the angular momentum out of the surrounding gas but then you've got energy left over i mean what what does it mean you draw the angular momentum you see a mode carries e equals j you either eat up that mode in which case you've eaten up its ang angular momentum and its energy okay let's say you take some of the gas and collapse it into something what is it properly the degree that shift the energy you shift it that that is bad sir that hurts you for the same reason right if you've got modes with e greater than j see the gas had e equals j okay there's no mode in the gas with e less than j okay so now some of the gas can try to become a black hole but it needs more energy it has to take the energy out of the big black hole so now the competition is that you're creating new entropy in this this thing but you're losing entropy from this guy and you can check that in that competition you always lose okay so this we did pretty seriously for for this kind of this this kind of check throw in but you can't throw in something with energy without also throwing the angular moment because the gas carries e equals j so if you lose energy but don't lose angular momentum then your gas carries j greater than e which is impossible it's unitarity right you think of throwing in a mode it eats up its e and its j and that day you always lose that's what this line is telling what you're doing is moving along this line up here you don't want to do that there's nothing as far as i can tell that you can do to further raise the entropy of this thing okay this is the la this is the thing i wanted to say in response to to rajesh please question please. Uh, so basically uh, what you did is that uh, you looked at the gas uh, and computed a local stress and yes resolve resolve by insane equations We've got a new metric. New metric. How do you know everything is good? What do you mean everything is good? Prior stability. Analysis. Yeah, because the stability analysis, the instability came from the black hole, and this black hole locally is say exactly the same as the black hole here, which is stable. Because any black hole at or below that blue curve is stable. You see, so black holes larger than one one stable. Black holes less than one were not. So we've explicitly exhausted that 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 thing. Okay, last comment, and I'll stop. The last comment is that you will find if you open our paper, it's a long paper. Uh, you will find two appendices of the paper, giving a new solution apart from this one. This solution we will, we call revolving black holes. And this solution I like. It turns out not to be dominant, but I like. I believe it has implications. I'm just telling you about it. You see. there is apart from the gas there is another thing that carries e equals j and that is if you set the black hole itself moving the black hole because it sits at the center of ads should be thought of as an ensemble of dominantly primaries these because primaries are things that sit at the center of ads okay if you excite the primaries to get macroscopic descendants of these primaries you can ask what that does on the gravity side roughly speaking what that does is take the black hole and start it moving around ads now some of you are thinking how can a black hole move around ads won't it radiate and slow down no because there's a symmetry there's another coordinate system in which the black hole that is moving around ads is just a twist it's just an so2 uh, d comma 2 transformation of the original set it's a perfectly good solution however the actual thing that carries the charge of the original black hole is not a classical black hole moving around ads almost that but a quantum state one in which this black hole is in a quantum state in the theta direction in the angle direction 
Uh, this is something I would love to explain, though I don't have the time, maybe over lunch if anyone's interested. So this final solution, which I believe is an exact solution of general relativity, exact solution of the theory, is a quantum state of a black hole moving around in EDS, okay, that carries the same angular moment, same charges as this point. It has almost the same entropy as the gray galaxy, because once again, the extra energy and angular momentum goes into E equals J modes, because derivatives, descendants carry E equals J. But it has slightly lower entropy, because in addition to the entropy of the black hole, you also have the entropy of the gas. That's one over N rather than one over N squared, but it's not zero, whereas this mode carries no entropy. So this, this is entropically subdominant compared to the gas, but it's a very beautiful and simple solution um, of the this, of this system. Now, I say this for two reasons. Maybe the most important one of which is this. Everything I said about this, about the first thing um, is, you know, thermal and so on. But the second guy exists even in supersymmetric situations. Okay. Uh, even in supersymmetric situations, you can take supersymmetric black holes and set it rotating. And set, look at the descendant state. You'll find this very completely analyzed in our paper. If you're interested, please look. Okay. This, I think, already addresses a, a long-standing puzzle about supersymmetric, uh, partly addresses a long-standing puzzle about supersymmetric black holes in N equals 4 Yangmills. The puzzle, as some of you know, is that while N equals 4 Yangmills theory has, apart from energy, five Cartan charges, and therefore a five-parameter set of extremal black holes, only a four-parameter subset of these black holes are supersymmetric. And this sounded weird. You might have thought that we should have had supersymmetric black, uh, states at all five the, you lower the energy, you get a supersymmetric states, all five, for all five parameters. There's no hint from the field theory for any special line in this, in this uh, five parameter set of charges. This is something that has puzzled people from certainly myself, but everyone who's ever thought about these black holes for a long time. Okay. This is prevalent flat space problem, right? Maybe. maybe. Yeah, this angular momentum kind yeah. of thing, right? Yeah. Angular momentum kind of thing. But here it's very puzzling from the field theory. Because in flat space also you can take a supersymmetric black hole and start rotating. Yes, yes, yes. That probably is what. Yeah, but you'd have to have, have this rotating around something. In flat space, how will you? No, that will not work. Then. The, this is this rotation is generated by an SOB comma two transformation. In flat space, all you can do is set in moving. Yeah, but now this solution exists as far as I can tell. We've not very carefully studied it, but you, uh, for this particular case, but I think it exists in the n equals four Yangmills theory. And it gives you this new parameter. Think of this as like the supersymmetric black hole line. And think of this additional black hole or parameter as, as how much rotation you put in. This generates a five parameter set of black holes. So I believe we have already by this construction demonstrated that in N equals four Yangmills theory, there exists a five parameter set of supersymmetric black holes and thereby given a lower bound for the entropy of supersymmetric states as a function of all five parameters. I say lower, lower bound because as you saw in our situation, this rotate revolving black hole solution existed but wasn't entropically dominant. The same may be true in the supersymmetric. But at least it shows you that there has to exist five parameter set of these black holes. Because whatever else exists has to be entropically larger than this one. Okay? I find this very interesting and it's something I have started working on. Uh, I feel that this, these ideas can play into the supersymmetric counting story of n equals four young means, which is another 20 year old story. Okay, that's it, thank you. In that space also the multi-center direct solutions are probably like that. Probably like this. Because right, they have angular moment. They have angular moment, they're probably rotating. So yes, yes. The nice thing about this is that it doesn't have a need to rotate around anything. It's just rotating around the center of ADS. Yeah. yeah. So one single black hole will do. One, one black, black hole does, yes. So it's much simpler. Uh, and, you know, the thing about it is that the, these solutions are generated by symmetry and so completely exact. You know, they're as exact as the original solutions. In fact, Spenta, I don't know if you looked at Appendix B, but it's full of uh, co-adjoint orbits. So, uh, if you haven't, please look at it. <laughs> look at it. Okay. <laughs> you see, it's usually... It could be more than one uh, black hole, but in this black hole game, um, you have to worry when you have two black holes, usually they attract each other. Okay, somehow or the other. In some supersymmetric situation, may happen. I don't know. But typically, 
generally speaking, you know, things want to clump up. Okay, so yeah. Uh, in this case, you might have worried that the gas would collapse into that second black hole. That does not want to happen. We check that carefully. There may be multiple black holes, but but somehow they are not collapsing into in the non-supersymmetric or supersymmetric. Supersymmetric. Supersymmetric case, all bets are open. Anything could be happening. That's why I said my revolving black hole is a lower bound. Actual solution may be more interesting, maybe very intricate. Actually, there may even be analogs of lasting. There may even be analogs of these gray galaxy solutions, supersymmetric context. Uh, yeah, I won't give you details, but you see, it's been more or less demonstrated that excitations around the black hole solution that are BPS exist, which is basically a and a BPS graviton on top of a BPS black hole. If those exist, why should gray galaxies exist? An ensemble of these might also exist. This is something we've just begun to explore. Yes. Uh, so I, I think you restricted to ADS4 because we didn't want the complications of additional angular momenta and so on in higher dimensions. Uh, but in ADS3, is there... Uh, in ADS3, ADS3 this is phenomenon there, never happens. Uh, the, the, if you look at the energy of black holes as a function of angular momentum, omega is always less than one, approaching one only at extremality, extremality which is the same as unitarity. So in ADS3... There is no question. Roughly speaking, this phenomenon is too interesting to exist in ADS3. You know, <laughs> gravity in ADS3 is a bit boring. Right? Yeah. But you could have had these, I mean, you do have the rotating BTZ. You do have them, but this, just look at the, if you just look at the thermodynamics, you see this, 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 this fact that if you, firstly, the extra, in rotating BTZ, the extremality curve is, the, is you know, E equals J. And if you look at the thermodynamics, uh, omega is always less than one, except at extremality, where it's equal to one. So the, the phenomenon does not exist. The, but, but from the field theory, I don't see why it's not. Ah, uh, I suppose it would be near extremality. Then, because omega equals one is same as near extremality. Um, okay, it's a good question. This I haven't thought about. It may be something similar to lack of both condensation in water. Maybe. I mean, yeah, it was it was a gas divergence, not a Bose condensate divergence. Uh, it's a good question, Rajesh. I hadn't thought of it. Yeah, the first thing to say about it is that it's going to be in equilibrium with us uh, with the uh, you know, where will it be in equilibrium weak? Right. There is extremality and omega equals one are on top of each other. It's certainly very different at least, right? Moving, it's sort of the question about at extremality, what do you gain by dividing up, expelling some extremal gas? I suspect you'll lose, right? But I don't know. I haven't thought about it yesterday. It's certainly very different. Marginal kind of thing, yes. And you entropically you might lose. But I haven't carefully thought about it. Or maybe maybe it's exactly on the edge, because it is omega equals one. And you're gonna to have to deal with this at extremality. So it's a bit if you try to construct a solution, it'll be a bit sensitive. But it's a good question. I haven't thought about it. I, okay. If you go one higher dimension, let's say we go to ADS5. Um, there's two okay. Here, I'd like to be cautious because in ADS5, there are all kinds of other solutions. You know, there are these black rings that are at least ADS6, black rings and so on, Saturns, and assuming they play no role. That's one of the other reasons we restricted to ADS4 because space of known black hole solutions is civilized. Okay, but, uh, if, you, uh, but if you assume those play no role, then we understand qualitatively what can happen. There are three situations, one, two interesting situations. You see, now we've got two two plates. You can have omega of this guy being near one and this guy being less than one, in which case you'll just get a gray galaxy in this direction. Similarly, if this is one and this is less than one. But suppose both go near one, say both are going near one and are equal, then actually in that situation, you have a residual SU2 symmetry. 
because omega 1 equals omega 2 preserves su2 left and that residue will su2 symmetry is, is enough to show that your gray galaxy solution will be radial symmetric so instead of being this galaxy kind of thing it becomes a spherical bump so details will change in the in this five dimensional case uh, there will be one thing which has this delta function localization here. another thing that is delta function localization here, and a third thing that is smooth, smooth stuff so it's a richer situation in higher dimensions, basically because you have more rotations to play with. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, right. Okay. Yeah, it's a very interesting question. The question is how do you understand this instability for omega greater than one in a field theory? I'll say some words. I don't know if they help you or not. You see, what is this? The, what we have is the black hole is a quark gluon plasma. This quark gluon plasma is rotating. Okay. Somehow, this quark gluon plasma finds that it's able to increase its entropy by expelling rotating glue balls. These rotating glue balls ex are expelled energy, expelled angular momentum. They go away from the quark gluon plasma. So now you've got a mix of quark gluon plasma and glue balls. That's a gas. And this somehow is better entropically than having all of the energy and angular momentum in the quark gluon. What we've done is understand this from the point of gravity. You see, why is it true in gravity? It's true in gravity because if you add energy to a black hole, it increases its entropy. If you remove, add angular momentum to a black hole, it decreases its entropy. And it's this competition that allows you to get gain entropy by throwing out the gas. Something similar is happening from the quark gluon plasma point of view. But how would you know that in field theory? I don't know. I think that's very interesting. And um, of course, if you buy the equation of state, yeah, if you take some information from gravity, maybe you could answer. I don't know if this helps. It's strongly coupled field theory. Very strongly coupled field theory. So how would you directly analyze, analyze it or even you know, sort of qualitatively understand? Yeah. 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 Now, right. The one, okay, very good. And maybe this is the end point of that turbulent instability, but the end point is not within fluid dynamics because this gas is not in a fluid, is not a fluid boat. So, yeah. So maybe what happens is that droplets go out and these droplets are atom sized. Yes. Yes. These gases. And they're going. Maybe it's that. The field theory divergence doesn't really the field theory, yes, yes. Yes, the field theory divergence can and will will happen also at recoupling, and maybe that's the place to understand. I, the, 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 however, the gap between extremality and omega equals one does not happen at recoupling. In the free theory, omega equals one is, is extremality. So free angles is like the three dimensional theory. So to understand this phenomenon, you'll have to go a little bit in perturbation coupling, theory. Yeah. yeah, finite coupling, surely. I, I mean, even small coupling. Small coupling, a yeah. Bit, yeah, yeah. By resumming yeah. diagrams. You'd have to include that effect somehow. Uh, one uh, additional comment uh, along these lines. Uh, you can ask this phenomenon that we're seeing, this sharp phase transition, what is important for it? Was it large lambda or large n? Or both? Okay. I see no reason that large lambda is playing any role. Okay. That if we take lambda to be a million instead of infinity, everything I'm saying goes through. And so, and so I suspect, as you were saying, that if, I take, if you take lambda all the way down to zero, only at zero will it be different. So everywhere along the lambda equals uh, zero curve. And you can think this through a little bit from the strong coupling side, large lambda side, and convince yourself that there's no issue. Large n is, of course, important. Because that gives you the parametric control over it. So it's a at least as a sharp phenomenon, classicality was important. Um, uh, large lambda was just so that we could calculate precisely, but I don't think it's qualitatively important. Are there any questions from the online audience perhaps? Please feel free to unmute yourself and ask. There seems to be nothing more. Uh, Logan. I just want to say, you just know, like this, uh, 
<laughs> yes. Uh, this is the statement that you can't get, you know, like things which are revolving around the different axes. Well, in this, in this three, two, you know, four-dimensional bulk solution, there was one axis which was naturally set by the chemical potential because we were computing something with one omega, and that picks out this axis. If you try to revolve around anything else, you're losing because you're getting it, you're putting in energy, but you're not getting as much z component of angular momentum as you could. So, so you would say that if it's a state, it's where things, you know, yeah, it will choose an axis. Yes, because it will carry some given angular momentum. That given angular momentum will give you an axis and it will settle down to rotating around that. Total angular momentum will set that. These axes will be all aligned for the black hole and the gas. Yes, that is our claim. In our paper, we have speculations for how the time evolution proceeds. And uh, I'll leave you to read, read those. Uh, just say one word about that. Uh, the, you see, as, the, I'm sorry, but uh, there's just, uh, okay. <laughs> you see, yeah, these, for the yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, so the, you see the modes at large L first go unstable, but the instability is a very small one because the mode at large L, If you look at the, you know, turn the question of solving this mode at large L into Schrodinger problem, that Schrodinger problem has a potential that looks somewhat like this. It does, doesn't really matter. The thing is that there is some potential that you have to tunnel through. It mainly lives here. The black hole lives here. And in order for this instability to, to, to be triggered, you have to tunnel through the centrifugal value. Okay. This tunneling is expensive like e to the power minus L. So, why large L modes go unstable first? The extent of the instability is extremely small, exponentially small. This is indeed why we could treat this as a non-interacting system. Right? If it was very unstable, it's not non-interacting. So we've got this competition. Let's say you start with at omega equals 1.5. The modes of very small L are much have much faster instabilities. So they will all be occupied first. But thermodynamics wants you eventually to go to large L. So it will go over time. We have sketched out a picture of how this will work. The, our picture sa says that for a while, it will look like a Bose condensate. Because when you have a finite number of modes, the best, way, the best you can do basically is a Bose condensate. Okay? But as time increases uh, to a time which we've estimated, it will start being occupied by the black hole. And the uh, uh, last thing I should have said is that people have done all kinds of numerics with uh, with the system. Chesler, Paul Chesler has tried to follow the numerical evolution of the system. Um, we compared our, the entropy of our solution with every known solution with the same angular momentum. And there are these things called black resonators, which uh, 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 Santos has, has worked on over many years. Okay. We've compared every known solution with the same angular momentum and entropy and shown that our, uh, our, our, Angular moment, uh, you know, our solutions, our gray galaxies, have uh, larger entropy than every known solution with the same charges in literature. Paul Chesler's solutions are evolving, and at some point he stops the evolution because the evolution gets so slow. For the reason I mentioned, he's hitting the L that are so large that now you'll have to wait longer and longer. Okay, but when he stopped his evolution, he started with some charges. His evolution had had increase in I don't know by eleven percent entropy. Our solution with the same thing will have eighteen percent. So oh, there's no evidence that any anything else is better than that. Well, the thermodynamics sees no spiral arms. The best thermodynamic solution is just this, this. Unless there's some instability that I don't know of. But in thermodynamics, I'm just using the thermodynamics of the gas. That sounds good. And no, I think I would say no. Yeah. Is the viscosity important? Uh, I'm treating it as an ideal gas. That's right. Uh, I'm treating it as an ideal gas. Uh, yeah, so it's always so confusing because at weak, it's a very weakly coupled gas. Now, weak coupling viscosity is large, right? That's always very confusing. Um, but so 
it's a very weakly coupled gas. It's a, the coupling is extremely weak. It's parametrically down. In one. For this reason, I thought we could just use free thermodynamics. Now, if there's something more happening, I don't, don't know. How would you see that something more? This is what the question is. Right, it's free. Yeah. How would you see this? Uh, yeah. I mean, I would ask in the end, if there is something more happening, it should, you should be able to predict the final state, which has larger entropy than this. Well, in Boltzmann equation, thermal equilibrium is usually a solution, is the endpoint solution, right? Uh, some instability, okay. Angular, angular direction. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, this I have not, I have not uh, thought, uh, thought about. Uh, uh, I, I suppose you could ask a similar question for free conformal field theory. If you take a free conformal field theory and compute its partition function, that is an exact computation. Yeah, I think it's impossible, right? Because it's an exact computation, the partition. There, once again, you get a rotating field. Okay, so but uh, so in the free theory, the maximum entropy solution is this. Now, if it's got very small interaction, those very small interactions are not going to change entropies in a, in some significant way. No, but it has to go to the solution with the largest entropy. So you you would have to be claiming that there is another solution with the larger entropy at the same charges. So, so then it has to be that in the free theory, there is another configuration which has a, al almost the same entropy as the thermal ensemble. But very little different. So then that can only matter if there was some degeneracy in the free theory. If there were two saddle points in the free theory which were equal, and you had to choose between them, then interactions matter. But if there's one dominant guy, how can a small interaction? Let me ask you, if, if this is your worry, let me ask the following question. Take free n equals four yang mills theory, you get a partition function. Partition function is that of a rotating field. Okay, turn on, turn on your interaction a little bit. There is it destabilized. That is a simple question because it's a question just of computing a partition function. So we don't have to worry about complicated things. So it would you would have to identify where in the computation of that partition function, there was some, some issue. Okay, I don't know, but uh, I think that would be a way of addressing. It would be a very similar question. Perhaps there was a, uh, perhaps the new parameter is one minus omega. Perhaps that is what you would be saying. Because otherwise it's impossible, I think. At finite value of one minus omega, I think it's impossible. That it's unstable. Because for the reason I mentioned, the partition function cannot abruptly change. Right? It's perturbation theory. Yeah. Uh, unless there are some last urgent questions, perhaps we can take the conversation to lunch. Let's thank Shiraz for a great talk. Four thirty.